Um, hello, everyone. I am Simone Bell from EMBL Heidelberg. Welcome to this uh, session of uh, short talks in the afternoon. I'm very happy to uh, introduce the five speakers today. We start uh, with a talk from my colleague Thomas Schwatzel from, from EMBL in Heidelberg. Hello, my name is Tom. I'm a research staff scientist at EMBL Heidelberg. And thanks to the organizers for letting me present DUSIC, our bioconductor package for the improved binding site detection in iClip and eClip data. For those who are new to the RNA binding protein field, um, a couple of years ago, we have thought that there are hundreds of RNA binding proteins in human. Recently, we found that there are actually thousands. Most of them do not have a known biological function for the RNA binding. If you compare them to transcription factors, transcription factors are better studied and there are a lot of diseases already associated with transcription factors. For RNA binding proteins, there are a lot of new stories to, to be, uh, be discovered. So it is of huge importance to find binding sites uh, to detect uh, binding sites and to infer functions from that. This can be done with eclip or iClip sequencing. Both methods are based on UV crosslinking. So we crosslink the protein with the UV light to the RNA. This is a covalent bond, so it's a very strong bond. And then sequence the remaining RNA here. Eventually, when the uh, reverse transcription occurs, um, it will stop more often than not uh, at the truncation sites. And then we can infer from the uh, read start site where the crosslink probably was. The biggest eclip uh, screen was done by ENCODE a couple of years ago. And they have over 200 data sets, a fantastic effort and uh, quite expensive data set um, in two, two cell lines. And they have done peak calling and, and detected the binding sites. So we have looked at that and found that the peak caller sometimes are really, really reproducible within the replicates, but sometimes they are hardly reproducible at all. So about 56% of the uh, found peaks are actually reproducible in the other replicate. Also, there are biases. Longer transcripts have more peaks. So we were in need of uh, improved method, um, but why does this happen? The properties of RNA binding proteins are quite different from transcription factors or ChIP-seq, like eclip is very different from ChIP-seq. For once you can have RNA binding proteins with, with a sequence specificity or position specificity, so they bind on very exact location, like the exon junction complex. But there are others, like the IRP1, IRP, IIE complex, which binds to stem loops, or some of them bind to UTR regions, and some of them are stacking. So the classical peak approach is actually uh, not always useful. Also, we have technical complications. For example, cross-linking actually uh, is quite inefficient. So you have less of 1% percentage uh, probability to, uh, that the cross-link actually will happen. Then there are read-throughs uh, where the reverse transcript days doesn't stop. Different uh, properties in library preparation and different controls. Actually, the controls are quite important because um, mostly, most of you will know IgG controls, especially for ChIP-seq samples. But here uh, in eClip, we're using SMIs, the size-matched input controls, which, are ex um, which our methods really uses. So we have developed two packages. One is called HTC Clip, which is the pre-processing package in Python. Uh, it's based on HSEq and it does uh, the extraction of the crosslink sites and it does the counting and everything else, annotation preparation and so on. 
Um, and secondly, we have uh, developed DUSIC, which is our bioconductor package, uh, which is the sliding window approach based on DSIC2. Um, and other than that, so it's similar to Seesaw, you might, a lot of you might know. Um, however, it has some uh, spe uh, specific functions for eclip analysis, for like the normalization and other things, the post-processing. Everything is well documented in the vignette. Please have a look if you want. Um, we love feedback as well. So we benchmarked our method. Um, with no, on RNA binding proteins with a known primary sequence motif. So, of the peaks or of the binding sites we detected, how many of them does, uh, do have a known motif? Here we see uh, on the very left side, this is actually the peak caller and this is actually the recently published revised peak calling um, with the correction here. Uh, and all of the other uh, um, box plots are um, different parameter combinations, you can see that our method is robustly better than the peak caller. We can also see this in this graph here. From We have three different motif sources, this from experimental source to a database and so on. Then we see that <coughs> the, the binding sites here, the, bob, uh, the box plots in gray, uh, all the binding sites detected in both methods. They have a certain amount of, uh, of uh, known motifs in their binding sites. And we can see in, in orange here that actually the binding sites only found in DUSIC are highly enriched in binding sites, whereas the binding sites only found by the peak cola are not very much enriched in the motifs. So we can say that um, that our method finds more binding, uh, binding sites with no motifs. And we use this uh, package in our recent studies. Um, one of them is now BioArchive, done by Ina Huppert, and uh, we very nicely can show that when inolase 1, which is a metabolic enzyme, is binding to RNA, actually the enzymatic uh, activity is inhibited. And so far so good. I hope I could give you a short overview uh, of DUSIC and RNA binding proteins. Um, and thanks to my supervisors, Matthias Henze and Wolfgang Huber. Um, and of course, Sudeep, who did all the work with me, and uh, all of the Huber lab and all of the Henze lab. And if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. And thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Tom, for this talk. Uh, we have time for questions. David Sick tried to correct for the sequence bias introduced by the nucleases. So actually, we do not uh, correct for this, and uh, we see we see at the moment uh, we do not have the benefits at the moment. So we don't use it at the moment. No. Thank you, Tom. Um, there are for the moment there are no more questions in the chat. And we still have time if, I mean, you can post your questions anytime. What we can also do is discuss questions at the end of the sessions. If someone uh, comes up, if a question comes up um, during the session, feel free to post it in the in the chat and we can discuss at uh, towards the end. Uh, yeah, I was just have thinking, you? Actually, yeah, you mentioned the, the window, right? I was wondering whether the, the, the choice of window, essentially, how strongly does it affect, essentially, the, the significance of the result? I mean, the sensitivity versus specificity? So we actually looked at that quite a lot. So we tested a lot of parameter combinations and one of the, the window sizes is a very uh, highly debatable th uh, thing. Um, and actually we found out that, um, and this is a bit counterintuitive, that um, you know you often expect a peak, but we what we see is actually that the crossing sites are more more often than not distributed, and you have more enriched regions than rather peak formations. Sometimes you have peak formation depending on the on the biology of the RNA binding protein, mm -hmm. and therefore that uh, you actually should adapt the window size to whatever you, um, binding behavior your protein has, um, and uh, therefore. Um, so this this can change, uh, and we we say that about seventy five nucleotides actually we get better results than smaller ones at the moment. Okay, 
And if we have time, maybe as a follow-up, now that you mentioned uh, the, the behavior of the binding protein, uh, do you can you detect maybe if one protein binds multiple uh, places in um, in a transcript rather than, or do you see one big peak, or can you you know? No, we can. This, this is one of the nice things. So we we are actually not biased towards like we have to find one region which is binding. We can actually find multiple enriched regions, and we could also test in a lab that those binding sites are real, uh, which is very nice. So because you know RNA is very structured, so we can bind on the one side and, and end on the other side. Yeah. Um, so so we are not biased towards this and this, this is actually a big advantage we see at the moment um and we do all the other work with the binding sites, you know disease networks and uh and uh, rna protein binding networks we are currently constructing which is quite interesting so we can also see that the binding sites we find in the anchor projects are for example more enriched in for uh, with disease mutations and so on that we are, we are preparing a manuscript for that cool all right. Thanks very much, Tom. The next speaker is Ying Cheng from the Genome Institute uh, in Singapore. Uh, and this is going to be a pre-recorded talk. And I will start the video now. Hi, I'm Ying Cheng from the Genome Institute of Singapore. Um, today, I want to present a method that we developed for long transcript discovery and quantification. Studying the transcriptome is very important to understanding not just how the cells work, but also to understanding genetic diseases at a molecular level. But the full transcriptome can be very complex. Here is showing a gene example with a large number of possible transcripts, and this is very commonly seen in human genes. Different isoforms from the same gene can have a different function. However, with short read sequencing, it can be very difficult to study differences in isoform expression. The complexity in the transcriptome may potentially be uncovered when using the nanopore long read sequencing technology. This is the long read alignments of the previous gene example. Various methods have been known to be used for long read um, quantification. Nanocount, designed for long read quantification. Feature count and Salman, more often used for short read. In addition to such methods, uh, simple transcript counts can sometimes be obtained from long read transcript reconstruction methods like Flare, String Title, and Talon, with or without um, additional steps needed. There has not been dedicated method that um, complete the annotation and performs transcript quantification on the curated annotation. Here we present Bamboo, uh, context-aware quantification method of uh, transcript expression with long read RNA seq In the first step, Bamboo perform a read alignment correction by assigning splice junctions to the most likely true junction based on annotations, presence of splice motif, and read support. After correcting possible um, alignment errors, reads with identical splicing patterns will be summarized into read equivalence classes. This step is performed on each sample separately. In the second step, Bamboo extend the reference annotations using information from all samples. Normal transcripts and genes which have sufficient support in the data are then included for transcript quantification. In the third step, Bamboo assign read classes to the extended annotations with distance calculated. In the last step, Bamboo perform EM assignment of these read classes to each transcript and provide full and partial lines estimates. And this um, full and partial lens transcript ex estimation is a new feature, uh, not implemented in the current version yet. So if you are interested, please look out for our preprint uh, release in the next few months' time. So how does Bamboo compare with e existing methods? We evaluated this with both uh, spiking controls and cell line data. To start, we evaluated the ability in transcript reconstruction on spiking isoforms, where we know the ground truth. And to mimic reality, half of the isoforms for each spiking gene from the reference annotations are removed. Precision and recall were estimated using JFET compare for identifying the correct splicing patterns of these isoforms. 
i.e. the intron chains, and for identifying the complete transcript, considering the boundaries of the terminal axons. Generally, we see that the precision and recall are very similar between methods. In terms of running time for 10 samples with 5 CPUs, we notice that Bamboo is comparable to String Title and much faster than Flare and Talon. When comparing the ease of use, we also see that Bamboo is probably the easiest to use, where users can perform transcript discovery and quantification at one step. Next, we compare the transcript quantification and mainly focused on spiking transcripts. Um, the scatter plot here showing um, compares the spiking transcript abundance estimates on the y-axis versus the true concentration levels on the x-axis. With complete annotation, i.e. where transcript discovery is not necessarily needed, comparing to transcript discovery methods that provide simple transcript counts, we found that Bamboo performs much better. Even when comparing to quantification method that use provided annotation, Bamboo also performs comparably good. However, um, the more realistic uh, scenario in usual life is the incomplete annotation case. In this scenario, we observe that with transcript discovery, Bamboo estimates both the present and missing isoforms with higher uh, accuracy than the simple counts from string tie 2 and talon. When we compare to methods without um, transcript discovery, we also see bamboo performs better. Particularly, we see that methods without transcript discovery tend to overestimate some of the transcripts with reads coming from missing annotations. These results have demonstrated that transcript discovery helps improving transcript quantification. Generally, um, Bamboo provides the most accurate transcript quantification estimates among all the methods. This slide um, briefly shows you how Bamboo can be used. Um, after installing to R, uh, you will need to provide the BAM file for the genomic alignments and provide the annotation object and the FASTA file. In the case where multiple samples are to be processed, you can process them together by providing a list of the path for the BAM files. If you have a GTF file, you can convert the GTF to GRANGERS list using functions from the package and then apply it to Bamboo. To summarize, we have presented Bamboo, a reference guided software designed for long read transcript discovery and quantification. Both uh, transcript reconstruction and quantification strongly influence each other, which is one of the key benefits of using long read. Bamboo is the only method that is specifically designed to do transcript discovery and quantification across all samples of interest. And we think that this is why um, Bamboo can make a big difference. And lastly, routes from Bamboo can be directly used for downstream analysis in R. It's completely um, documented, fast and easy to use, and we hope that this will be very useful for analyzing long read RNA seq data. To end, I would like to acknowledge Eurobug for this opportunity to present my work. I would like to acknowledge my PI, my team members, as well as collaborators contributed from different research domains. With that, I will end my presentation here and thank you for your attention. And now I would like to take any questions. Thanks very much, Ying Chen, for this talk. Uh, we have time for one question and there is a question in the chat. Um, would you recommend any filter that users themselves should apply or visualize to exclude least robust transcripts produced during discovery? Or does Bamboo does all the filtering needed? 
Um, currently, um, we have implemented some filtering in the bamboo, but um, this is mainly for um, at a root support level. So currently, we have this uh, minimum sample support. So this uh, change could need to be available, um, existing in multiple samples. So you can change the threshold for that. Then there is also this minimum read support where you can also change, um, customize yourself in the bamboo. Um, for the others, currently, um, we currently um, filter all the subset transcripts, meaning that if it's a subset overlapping with the existing annotations, then it's also not included in the new as a new uh, transcript. Yeah. Thanks very much. Well done. <laughs> so we move on to the next speaker, and this is David again from the University College London. So, David, I hope you are ready now. Cool. Thank you very much. And, and ve very sorry for the, uh, the technical difficulties. And thank you for your, your patience. Um, hi. So I'm David, and I'm a PhD student in the writing lab at UCL, working on using RNA sequencing to improve the genetic diagnosis rate of patients with rare diseases. Today, I'm going to take you on a whistle-stop tour of my uh, bioconductor package, DASPA, which is aimed at detecting aberrant splicing events from RNA sequencing data. So the majority of patients that enter a diagnostic laboratory, unfortunately, still leave without knowing the genetic cause to their disease. RNA sequencing has come along um, and been shown to have diagnostic utility in such cases. Um, the four papers that I've shown here below um, started using RNA sequencing for diagnostics and have a range of success between 5 and 35 percent. The reason that we decided to focus on aberrant splicing um, is that we found when scouring these papers that the majority of diagnoses were made through detection of aberrant splicing, which suggests that the scope for diagnostics um, seem to be the highest with, with splicing. Previous methods um, have employed either a simplistic z-score approach, a statistical approach, such as leafcutter MD on the left, or used an autoencoder-based correction of RNA sequencing data um, that they claim allows uh, better identification of outliers, uh, such as Fraser on the right here. When we were surveying the methods available, we found that in general, they were limited by focusing on disruptions to junction counts, and also often looking only at novel upregulated junctions that were never found in controls. DASPA improves upon both of these points by incorporating disruptions to coverage as well as junction counts, and also looking at the downregulation of canonical junctions explicitly, as well as novel junctions. To illustrate this a bit more clearly, I'll take you through an example of a pathogenic event that we've looked at in, in one of our patients. Here, um, we show the pathogenic gene, NDUFA4, and the red X marks the site of the pathogenic mutation. What you can see is that in the junction data, there are disruptions in the nearby region um, with these two novel junctions in red and in green that are never seen in controls. But not only do we see that, we also see the complete disappearance of this blue junction that is always or ever expressed in your control sample. And if we take a look at the coverage across the dream above, what we saw was that in the site of the pathogenic splicing event, there were also coverage disruptions. And together, these two um, junctions and coverage disruptions we found characterized every pathogenic splicing event that we looked at. 
and is what we use to inform our improvements when developing DASPA. So now I'll take you through a methodological overview of the DASPA R package. The expected user input to DASPA is some patient RNA sequencing data and also some control RNA sequencing data. And this can be publicly available. DASPA then includes functions that allow you to load and normalize your junction data, calculating a, a proportion or percentage spliced in to allow for comparison between patients and controls. Then it will score the junction counts based on how um, different the count is compared to the same distribution of counts of the same junction in your control samples. Coverage data takes a similarly, similar processing path whereby it's loaded, normalized, and also scored. Um, in this case, the same region of coverage, for example, either the flanking exons or intron of a junction is compared to the coverage across the same region in your control samples. We then take those junction count scores and those coverage scores, and for each patient, we in input these into an outlier detection model, namely a isolation forest, which will aggregate together these features into an outlier score that represents how aberrant a particular splicing event is. Then we rank based on this outlier score, and that's what DASPA outputs to a user, a ranked list of all splicing events in each patient with one representing the most aberrant splicing event. We also include a set of um, sashimi plot functions that allow a user to manually inspect the um, splicing events, for example, if they have um, specific candidate genes or if they want to publish or plot for publications. So next, I just wanted to touch upon one aspect of the analysis we've done to assess the performance of, of DASPA. Before I do, I'm just going to cover the samples that were used in this analysis. We have 16 patient samples um, whereby we've taken the fibroblasts from these rare disease patients. And importantly, these patients have pathogenic mutations that are known to impact splicing and therefore serves as positive controls when validating the, the DASPA method. As controls, we compared the use of 504 publicly available GTEx samples, tissue matched, um, so we use fibroblasts, and also 50 in-house sequenced um, patient samples as controls. Here, what I show on the x-axis are the ranks outputted by DASPA. And each point um, here specifies a single pathogenic event for a single patient. Um, David, uh, yeah. you have one minute left. Thanks. Sure. sure. Um, where the lower the rank, the better DASPA is performing. Um, and the two take homes uh, I'd like you to, to have from here is that one, as we use OMIM gene filters, we reach relatively low ranks um, with both sets of control samples. And these are also obtained without any variants or phenotypic filters, um, which would cause uh, you would expect to further lower the ranks in a diagnostic setting. Just to mention that DASPA is now available on Bioconductor 3.12, um, and if you do have um, data that you would like to process with DASPA, don't hesitate to get in touch, and um, um, uh, I'm very happy to, to help in any way. Uh, it just leaves me to acknowledge um, the rest of the lab that helped um, the clinicians and patients that generously donated their samples, and also um, collaborators at the Libra Institute and John Hopkins, um, which really aided in the development of DASPA as a bioconductor package. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, David, for this great talk.
Um, we unfortunately don't have time for questions I, um, because we are running out of time. I would like to suggest that uh, if people have questions, um, so you can you can uh, contact the speakers anytime at the platform and then just meet in one of these wonderful virtual tables uh, in the lounge. So thanks, and we move on to the next speaker, uh, who is Mattia Furlan from the Italian Institute of Technology in uh, Milan. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, hello, my name is Mattia. I am a postdoc in the Epigenomics and Transcriptional Regulation Group of IIT in Milan, and today we present you some work on transcriptional and post-transcriptional dynamics. So here, in this cartoon, you see the most important steps of the RNA life cycle, which are premature RNA synthesis, premature RNA processing, and mature RNA degradation. Nowadays, it's quite uh, simple to collect information about uh, RNA uh, levels inside the cell with uh, next-generation sequencing platforms. However, these data alone are not enough to really understand uh, what's going on in terms of gene expression programs. For instance, if uh, we have an experiment and we see between two conditions, an increase uh, of uh, mature RNA expression uh, uh, levels. We are tempted to, to conclude that there is a transcriptional induction of the associated gene. However, the very same result can be due to a modulation of transcript stability uh, with a very, very different biological outcome from our analysis. So the, the characterization of the entire RNA life cycle is mandatory to, to really study gene expression programs. How can we do that? Uh, we can uh, perform. We can start with the mathematical modeling of this uh, process. Uh, for instance, uh, with a simple chemical reaction network, a network of uh, three reactions: uh, synthesis, processing, and degradation, with the corresponding kinetic rates uh, k1, k2, and k3. We have a system of two ordinary differential equations associated with uh, uh, this uh, network that we can use to fit premature and mature RNA expression uh, data coming from uh, total RNA-seq experiments. Here you see the steady state solution of this uh, system. And you see that uh, we are in trouble because we have two equations and three unknowns. And the, um, the most common approach to solve this uh, uh, under determination issue is to add uh, an additional datum to the uh, data set, which is the amount of nascent RNA. This can be collected, for instance, uh, through ForestioSeq and uh, is almost an experimental uh, proxy of, uh, of the synthesis rate. In any case, uh, uh, it, uh, it introduces a third equation that we can use to close the system and solve uh, our, our inference. So from uh, ForestioSeq uh, plus total RNA-seq, uh, we can uh, estimate the full set of the kinetic rates. Um, INSPECT is a bioconductor package available since 2015. Uh, to perform these uh, inference, so modeling, model selection, and so on, uh, at steady state and uh, with uh, this kind of uh, off-time course data sets. Unfortunately, for SUSIC, is affected by several limitations. Once among all, the, the, net, the nascent RNA contamination, which can affect uh, um, severely the, the quality of the results. Um, and is difficult to keep under control. So we decided to, um, to extend uh, the inspect package uh, with a novel approach uh, called inspect minus uh, to study RNA dynamics uh, from uh, total RNA seq data only, so without an instant RNA. Here you see three examples uh, um, where we have uh, a modulation of the um, of the kinetic rates and uh, different uh, steady state uh, values of this quantity. And here you see uh, the corresponding uh, uh, profiles of premature RNA, the dashed line and the mature RNA, the solid, the solid line. And you see that uh, um, these uh, regulations leave specific footprints on the on premature and mature RNA profiles. And this is the, the information that we want to exploit to perform our inference. Okay, uh, I decided to skip the, the implementation part uh, and move to validation and uh, results. Here you see um, some validation on the classification performance of INSPECT both INSPECT plus, so with nascent RNA, and INSPECT minus, so without nascent RNA. Uh, here we try to understand if uh, we are able to uh, identify variable uh, versus uh, constant synthesis, processing, and degradation rates in simulated data. On the x-axis, axis you see the length of the time series, and here you, you have the F1 score. 
for uh, synthesis and processing, uh, uh, Inspect Plus and Inspect Minus uh, have similar performance. Uh, and uh, more interestingly, uh, for the degradation rate, uh, Inspect Minus outperforms Inspect Plus. So we are removing information and we perform better. The reason uh, is that we are also getting rid of um, confounding factors like nascent RNA contamination. So we applied our tool to several datasets. Here you see a couple of examples. Uh, the first one uh, um, is a dataset uh, collected after MIC activation in uh, uh, murin fibroblasts. Here you see the log two fold change uh, of the RNA species um, and the, inf the, the same quantity for the inferred uh, kinetic rates, synthesis, processing, and degradation. Uh, MIC is a transcription factor, so we expected uh, um, a strong regulation of the synthesis rate, and uh, this is the outcome of our analysis as you can see here, and also in this um, bar plot. The situation is very different for TH17 differentiation. Here, uh, the, the biological uh, stimuli is uh, much more complex and uh, requires the regulation, the strong regulation also of post-transcriptional rates, as you can see from the, the heat maps and also from the bar plot. Okay, um, what about the steady state? As I previously mentioned, uh, here we have this underdetermination under issue, so we can only estimate uh, the ratio of premature over mature RNA, which is equal to the ratio of degradation over processing rate that we call post transcriptional ratio. This quantity is uh, not informative about the synthesis rate and uh, is aggregated, so it does not provide um, any chance to, to deconvolve the, the rule of degradation from the rule of, of processing. In any case, we reason that a modulation of this uh, ratio between condition could point to interesting post-transcriptional regulations. So uh, with INSPECT, we work on the log2m, log2p space. In this uh, space, we infer a linear uh, model to take into account uh, um, um, the, the expected modulations of the rates. Uh, when I say expected, I mean that uh, uh, when we have a transcriptional uh, uh, regulation. We expect also the adaptation of the post-transcriptional rates to this uh, um, to this uh, regulation, and uh, we are not really interested uh, in this kind of post-transcriptional regulation. So we decide to take into account uh, of uh, of them with this uh, linear model. In this case, the outliers are uh, genes uh, which, in specific conditions, uh, are atypically post-transcriptionally regulated. This Thank model you. is the. Hi, yes. you have one minute left. Thank you. Of course, yes, yes, thank you. Um, this model is defined by the slope that you can see here. And uh, in red here, you see, uh, as I said, the, the, the post transcriptionally regulated genes in a bunch of samples uh, uh, that you can see here. Uh, we validated our model uh, with um, looking for Mirna enrichment. And you see that. Uh, uh, we got the strongest enrichment uh, uh, for uh, um, a slope of the linear model very close to the one inferred by INSPECT. Uh, we also tried to validate our uh, results in a specific sample like brain, finding uh, the involvement uh, of, um, in, in our post description regulated genes, the involvement uh, of uh, important layers of regulation like uh, uh, RNA methylation. This is my last slide. Let me conclude uh, introducing uh, uh, you our new graphic user interface uh, to interact with INSPECT. In my opinion, this is a very uh, nice entry point for uh, researchers with limited uh, experience in uh, mathematical modeling uh, who are in interested in these uh, kind of uh, topics. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and the possibility to present my work. And also thank you to all my collaborators from uh, Perizola's lab and outside. Thanks very much, Mattia, for your talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, we unfortunately again don't have time for questions because we are running out of time. But Sorry. I <laughs> I hope the speaker is available uh, at the conference and you can you can meet him this week at Air Meet or perhaps during the poster session today. So then we move on to our last speaker, uh, who is uh, Louise uh, Hugh from the Liba Institute for Brain Development in Baltimore. Welcome, Louise. Hello. And, um, hi, you are welcome to start sharing your screen. Hello, everybody. I'm Louise Hukey. I'm a research associate at the Liba Institute for Brain Development in Baltimore. And today I'll be presenting our work on correcting for cell type RNA fractions in MDD RNA-seq data. 
Um, some background on major depressive disorder, which here we abbreviate as MDD. Um, it is a wide range of symptoms that can include depressed mood, reduced energy, concentration, or suicidal thoughts. Um, it is among the largest cause of worldwide disability. It has a lifetime prevalence of 17% and a heritability estimated to be 30 to 40%. Um, our overall goal of this work is to examine differences in script transcriptominal mechanisms between the brain tissues of individuals with MDD, bipolar disorder, and neurotypical control individuals. Um, the data we have is um, bulk RNA-seq data from 1,091 samples from 595 individuals across two different brain regions, the amygdala and SACC. Um, so one of the analysis we want to uh, conduct is uh, exploring differences and proportions of different cell types between these samples, um, examining if there are differences between these diagnoses, and then using these proportions control for differences in other anal analysis. Um, the deconvolution methodology we're using is based on work by other, other groups in the institute. Um, so this is based on a preprint by Cecenia, available in BioArchive. Um, they found the highest accuracy for deconvolution um, with single nucleus RNA-seq uh, was using the music algorithm plus reference data from the same brain region and filtered markers. Um, and then the single nucleus RNA-seq data is also from work at the Institute. Um, this is done by Matt Tran and that is also available in a preprint. Um, he identified 10 specific and six broad cell types in the SACC and then 12 specific six broad cell types in the amygdala. So the first step in this process was we needed to find marker genes to use in the, to use in the analysis. Um, at first we evaluated marker genes using a one versus all t-test using the find markers function and the SCRAM package. Uh, uh, we determined that the top five genes for each broad cell type here um, ranked by standard full change. And um, here we showed the results for the SAC, which we'll focus on for to keep things short. Um, so here we visualize the expression of these markers by creating a heat map of the pseudo bulk singular nucleotide data um, as a column and the different marker genes as rows. Um, so with one versus all, we observed lots of noise between different cell types we weren't confident that these markers would be the best marker genes um, for the analysis in music. So yeah, here we were trying to explore um, the marker expression by each cell type, um, trying to find the cause of that noise that we saw on that heat map. And the main thing that we were seeing is that there was outliers in one or more non-target cell type. Um, so in this plot here, the oligulo uh, cell types being the target cell type and um, which is in orange, all the other colors being other non-target cell types. Um, so we, we developed a metric that we're calling mean ratio, which is the ratio of the mean of the target expression over the highest mean, or the highest mean of the non-target expression. Um, so for this gene here, um, the mean expression of our oligulo um, divided by the next highest expression, which would be an OPC. Um, so then we ranked uh, ranked our marker genes by that ratio, and the highest ratio genes were which we selected, which we showed down here. Um, so we're just looking for genes where the expression in the target is very different from any other cell type. Um, so comparing that to our old metric, um, we saw that our top mean ratio genes also have very high fold changes. Um, so we think that this metric is helping us remove any of the noisy genes, but not selecting for any genes that have low fold changes. So here we visualize the marker genes as a heat map again, and we saw a much cleaner pattern of expression with our new metrics, which are to the right, than the old uh, log fold metric to the left. Um, so we think that this set of markers will produce more accurate results after we run music. So our next step is applying this to our more specific cell types. Um, we saw the same pattern of our 
new metric versus a standard log full change. However, for some cell types, there the ratios are there aren't as many outliers in the ratio. So we think that some of these are going to be more of a challenge to select good marker genes for. And that is also what we observed um, visualizing this as a heat map. Um, the specific cell type heat map being to the right, broad to the left. Um, so we see a lot more noise with these more specific cell types, but we think that there's enough difference between our target cell type and non-targets that these will still be usable marker genes. Um, so finally, we ran music on this data. Um, these are box, box plots of the results. Um, for right now, we didn't see any strong differences in the diagnoses in um, the SACC for specific cell types. Oops. So next steps, uh, we need to apply the same methodology to the amygdala data. Um, we've shown the heat map of this. Uh, we saw it's proving to be more complex. There's more uh, specific cell types. Um, we might need to be, do more filtering to have good markers for this region. Uh, we'd also like to check out the biological reasoning behind these marker genes, see if there's any reason they might prove to be good marker genes for that cell type, and then maybe assess this marker finding method on exter external single nucleus data. Um, and then forward steps in this project, um, we plan to control for differences in sample cell types, proportions for other um, for the other analysis, such as differential expression, EQTL funding. Yeah, so I'd like to thank everybody that helped me with this project. Um, my collaborators at Lieber Institute, um, John Hopkins, and um, especially Leonardo Colado Torres, um, Carrie Matinovich, Kirsten Maynard, Andrew Jeff, and Metran. Ah, yes, hi, yeah, thanks very much. Thank I, I, I didn't, I wasn't sure if I can still hear you. Very good, thanks very much. Uh, there is a question in the chat, so I think we could reply to this as one one last question. Uh, so it says, how does the mean ratio approach compare to other specificity measures? And there is also a link, but I mean, it doesn't mm. doesn't help yet now. Um, no. That's definitely Please. something we're still uh, working on. It'd be, uh, I'd have to take a look at the link to <laughs> know what they're talking about there. but. Um, yeah, we're, we're discussing this uh, this method with our collaborator, collaborators and um, trying to see how far results look reasonable moving forward. Uh, I'll t have to take a look at that link. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, take a look at the link. Thanks very much. Yeah, so uh, thanks again to all the speakers in the session. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to meet at the platform and, and continue chatting about the talks and uh, everything you are interested. And enjoy the conference and don't miss the poster session tonight at quarter past six uh, Central European time. <laughs>